Who's here because they care about security? Excellent, you're all in the right room. Welcome. Um, I'm gonna talk today about uh, managing security risk and how community engagement is one of your best mitigation strategies. I am the executive director at the Python Software Foundation. So some of these examples are kind of, will sound Python-y, so you'll have to translate to crates or whatever in your head um, when I give examples uh, for if you're not a Python user. Are there a lot of Python users in the room? All right, about half, great, cool. So the first thing, um, when I think about security, I think about like bad surprises. Like um, no one wakes up and is like, oh sweet, somebody hacked our computers and our servers are all down. Like hooray, surprise, it's my birthday. It's not. So there are good surprises. Like this kind of famous tweet where someone showed up as the Baba Duck at a grown-ups drinking wine party. That one's pretty funny. That's a good surprise. Um, we're not going to talk about good surprises, though. We're going to talk about bad surprises. So, for an example, um, this is a this was a, on Reddit a while ago. It said magic number in the code caused a multi-state 911 outrage outage. Sorry, not outrage. Um, but uh, so, for folks that don't know, that's like the emergency services. And so, um, this is it affected 12 million people. Um, over 6,600 calls to 911 in that period of the outage never reached a person. No one died. Um, obviously, there was the potential for that to happen. I'm not here to tell horror stories, but to more share a cautionary tale. Um, the entities involved were this company called Entrado and several different state agencies. And one of the issues was that they had just two centers that were providing um, emergency call services for 12 million people. So that's like, it's almost like that, uh, that guy in Nebraska, but like holding all of emergency services for many states. Um, so that was obviously not great. And then um, presumably like, uh, someone at different states in the U.S. knows how many emergency calls they expect. Um, and then they contracted with Entrado that hit a magic number that was like, we're full, no more calls. Um, so somehow Entrado never got the memo that there is what the capacity is expected to be. And then also all these state agencies, maybe they were supposed to like flush out all the records and start again at zero, which sounds messy and bad also, but um, they didn't do that either. So somewhere in there was some pretty poor communication. And I think that poor communication um, in any ecosystem is gonna lead to bad results. Another thing I think that happened here is this increased usage with no understanding of the resource that is being used. Um, and that obviously is sort of a brittle, not good situation. Like you can't just keep putting more on if you don't know what you're putting it on. And then finally, leaving key stakeholders out of the conversation obviously is gonna lead to bad surprises. And so, um, like really literally anyone that understood the expected numbers versus the system that they were employing would have been amazing. That person was not at the table, whoever they were or people, uh, multiple states. So um, so how is open source different? So Entrado is a proprietary company that sells contracted services to state agencies. Um, it, it's not good. Um, I don't know if you have heard the like, hey, if you're rummaging through our dumpster for code, like you should not expect to get like white glove service. Um, and so this is, this is not good. Like if you are treating your upstream and sneaking in in the middle of the night and taking the code and not talking to them, then all of those things are potentially happening for you with your relationship with your upstream because it's non-existent. So mitigation level number one. Passive listening. So get on the mailing list. I know mailing lists are so 1990s or whatever, but a lot of projects still use them. And if the project your business depends on is using one, someone from your company should be on that mailing list, right? Uh, you can also look for uh, newsletters and podcasts. This is going to let you know what the release cycle is, when big changes are coming. Like you will get like a year from now, we're going to make a massive change to the programming language. And you will have a whole year to figure out what that means for you. 
Um, I would also say look at the GitHub repository uh, for the project that you are slurping into your business because uh, you want to see responsiveness and recent activity. Uh, you know, this is, this is kind of like if you are depending on this or your customers, millions of customers are depending on this and you're like, oh, the repo, no, I don't know. Or, like, this is not a good situation. This is going to lead to surprises. The other thing I would say is uh, take a look at who is funding a project that you depend on um, because funders and in-kind supporters are key stakeholders. So if your project is being funded by a university, you might wonder why does no one answer anything on GitHub in the summer? Oh, wait, everyone who is contributing to this code is gone for the summer. Um, and so that, no surprises, right? You're like, oh, this is being run by the University of Ohio. Ohio, they come back on September 5th, and that's when my thing will get answered, hopefully. Um, some red flags uh, that you might encounter in your journey in passive listening. Um, mailing lists are extremely unprofessional or even hostile. This means that sometimes project decisions get made by one angry person and not because it's the best thing for the project or what have you. Um, I don't know how you run your business, but I try not to have my livelihood depend on one angry person or a group of angry people. It's one of those things that doesn't, they don't cancel out. Uh, very unexpected key stakeholders. So, uh, for instance, uh, a prince of a country that doesn't have a monarchy is in charge of the whole project. This is not good. This is not going to lead to stability. Um, I would say that's not a project you want to depend on. Uh, a single frustrated and overworked person, XC. Um, this is maybe also like a red flag that you should be like, oh, you know, and there's there's mitigation strategies. You could reach out and say like, hey, can we help? Um, but if you just keep putting load on a person that is already complaining about how they're frustrated and tired and overworked, um, you should expect that system to eventually break. Mitigation level number two, open up a dialogue with your upstream. So come to a conference like this. If there is a conference, for the tech stack that you depend on, and they have a big annual meeting where everybody that cares about that programming language or that uh, operating system goes to, then you should be going there. Uh, and then while you're there, you can give positive feedback on plans that you like so that you can reinforce the things that you wanna see uh, in the project. I would also say try to, um, do a meeting once a year with your upstream. So, uh, and this is, I would say, make sure that information is shared in both directions when you do that. Um, you should keep in mind that a group of volunteers on which your business depends don't actually work for you, so you cannot demand that they uh, talk to you. Um, I would also say if you're looking for interaction with your upstream and you're posting like on LinkedIn or on X, like does anyone know who's in charge of, um, this is not the right place to be heard. Um, so uh, that's, I have yet to encounter a project that is so small that their social media manager is also a core developer. Um, because what happens when there's only one person, they just don't look at the social media. So, uh, so don't, don't complain on the internet, find the right place within the project to bring your feedback in. Red flags in this area. Um, the project doesn't seem to wanna talk to people. So make sure once you've figured out that you're looking in the right place, you've found the real repository, you've found the real you know, bug reporting place, you've found the real uh, you know, entity that actually holds the IP for this code that you depend on, um, and they're like, yeah, no, we just don't actually like talking to users. That's a red flag. You might wanna consider using something else. Mitigation level number three. So, so you're like, oh, I'm the open source person at our company, that's great, but getting more people involved is going to be less brittle. Maybe you get promoted or you go to another company, you get a great deal, you win an island or decide to have children and not go to every open source conference on the face of the earth anymore. If more people are involved at your company, then that relationship can continue. And, and this, is, this is good for everyone. Um, one strategy that you might think about how to like identify who's interested in doing these things 
is encouraging internal guilds or learning groups. This is something uh, that we know people do for Python. They uh, like, so you get like more experienced Python developers talking with less experienced Python developers. They're skilling up, they're sharing information about conferences that are happening. They're sharing information about like what they read that's going on with the tech stack. And so this is great. It's uh, like has this nice follow on effect of actually making your people like more, uh, skilled at the tech that they are using and creating a little camaraderie around the work that they're doing together. Um, so, you know, this is, you do this in the office. It's not an office after hours optional thing. Um, if you do not encourage people to learn things, then you will end up with a, a whole staff full of people that don't like learning things. And let me know how that works out for you. Um, I would also say, try to fix it so your people can patch. So you could, uh, first step here is to make sure that you can do it. So this means talking to your legal department because um, a lot of times, if you start having people patch without talking to your legal department, they'll come find you. Um, and this is not good. Um, they don't like to be left out of the loop. So go and talk to them. Keep in mind that lawyers work for you. So a lot of Lawyers have been trained by like sort of a old guard where they're like, we give nothing away. And so um, you may have to do a little like, hey, like uh, one common strategy here is to get your lawyers to talk with other lawyers that have already done open source. There are networks and places that they all talk to each other and figure out best practices on how to get it so that your company can patch on the things that you want to patch on. Um, and patching. This also means that instead of having like each release, we have a brittle, annoying process that we do before we can update in-house that is like increasingly longer as your usage deviates from the core. This is not good. This is the place where this is going to break. Eventually, the person who understands all 27 steps will go work somewhere else, and then you will have to pass this on to another person. This is, you don't want that. Just put it in the upstream, and then you don't have to worry about it anymore. So, red flags in this area would be if you encounter a project where patches are not welcome. So most open source, like they're like, yeah, patches are welcome. And sometimes they say it, but they don't mean it. Um, so there's a little bit of education there sometimes. Sometimes it's a little bit of like, oh, it needs to be in a certain style and it has to go through a certain review process. Figure out what the process is, but if it's still like no, then you should find out why. I will say that um, Patches that are good for your company but break things for every other user are never going to be welcome. So don't send those and be like, I didn't get my patch in. And it's like, you were trying to make it so that you have a monopoly in this area. Like, that's not what open source is for. So mitigation level number four, uh, become a community partner. So uh, one of the things involved in that means meeting your counterparts at other companies, AKA your competitors. And this sometimes can feel really weird. Like we're going to talk to our competitors, really? Like, and, but you can find shared work, especially like there might be like common work across like security patching. There might be um, common work around like making things faster. So that's something that uh, companies work on together in Python. Like it's, they're like, we want it faster. And it's like, feel free to work on that. Amazing. Um, so this, this is great because it also like gives you an opportunity to learn more about how other people use the tools you rely on. It also means that um, the code is going to be stronger because it's been tested in more situations than you have used. So you might get a situation where you're like, oh, we're going to deploy to like another part of the world. And one of your competitors has already done it, has already figured out like some of the bugs, some of the pain points, and it's already been taken care of. And then, but you know, another time it might be you. Uh, pioneering stuff and your competitors learning from you. And getting comfortable with that and understanding that if we're using a shared resource that that is going to happen is, uh, it's, it requires a little bit of a mind shift. But again, like we want as few surprises as possible, right? 
Another um, strategy for getting really involved with your upstream uh, involves looking at beta releases. And not just like knowing that they exist, but like really looking at them and going through them. Uh, this is a thing that happens in Python a lot where we have put something out, like our uh, release candidate, it's gonna be like in 10 months, here's what's on the to-do list, here's the code, here's the strategy, here's the conversation. You know, we push it out and then someone's like, my thing broke, I'm so mad and about this surprise. And it's like the surprise that we've been talking about for 10 months in public, that, that surprise. Oh, yeah, you don't, don't be that surprised person. You can look at the betas for the code that you depend on. And especially when large changes are coming. So you might read through like what's on the docket and it's like, oh, we're just doing small stuff and maybe you skip looking at the beta that time. But if it's something really big and you're like, oh, wait, I almost, that, it feels like you almost mentioned my workflow by name, uh, then you should be looking at the betas. Um, and sometimes, like, so for instance, in Python, we're going towards making the global interpreter lock optional. That means multi-threading, which has actually been in the language for so long that it almost touches everything. So for that kind of thing, looking at your workflow and comparing what you're getting and what you're going to start getting with the new release is super important. So, um, so do definitely look at betas, especially if it's... Like, it's one thing if you're like, oh, I, we use a little desktop calendar app, fine, don't look at the betas, I don't care. But if you're like, our business model is to be super enmeshed in this particular tool and we depend on it, then you should be looking at betas. Uh, another thing I would say is to get to know your upstream contributors. Um, like kinda, you know, you're showing up at these conferences, you're not like, you know, silently lurking, like looking through the window, you're interacting, you're talking to people, you're sitting in the conversations where things are happening. And you want it to be a situation where everyone's like, yay, you're here, so glad. Um, because if you only show up with complaints for a group of people who, again, don't work for you, um, they're maybe not gonna tell you where the meeting is all the time. They might forget to invite you and things, so, you know kind of bring a positive presence and um, make sure you're not just full of complaints and definitely not coming in with an entitled, like, why won't you do these things for my company that I want done? Um, because nonprofit code bases are for everybody. And so they are not actually allowed to just sort of on the side do work for your company. And asking is not gonna create a good relationship. People are not gonna be excited to see you. I would also say don't wait for the no good, very bad day to make contact with your upstream, like the day when the repository goes down or the day when the vulnerability happens or the, the day the White House wants to talk to everybody that's using that code. Um, don't wait for that day. That's a, you know, uh, it's, so that's a super hectic day uh, already for everyone, for you, of course, but also for your project. So if you're like, oh, like, I decided uh, this morning I saw there was a massive vulnerability that uh, affected the whole ecosystem. I'm going to try info at Python and demand that my thing gets fixed immediately. Where do you think that's going to go? Mm, yeah. Um, this is not going to get a good result. You will, if, if you know something or you have something or you can um, add to like what is happening or like maybe you have people inside your company that are like we found this quick and dirty workaround if you want to share it with other people in the ecosystem while you work on something more long term that's an amazing uh, way to offer to help but if you don't know who to contact and where to report vulnerabilities or who to talk to about outages and you've waited until it's already happening and it's happening in multiple places uh, it's going to be hard for you to get through to the person you need to talk to. So build those relationships before the no good, very bad day. Uh, another thing I would say is to find out what your ecosystem needs. Um, and it could be a lot of different things. Like different projects need different things. It's uh, 
sometimes it's just a weird little thing and it might be something that you can help with. Um, and it might not actually be money. I'm gonna go there next, but um, it might not be money. Sometimes they need help with the trademark. Sometimes they need help with accounting, like a place to keep money. Um, sometimes they need help with testing, help with security, uh, feedback on workflows and protocols, like how people are using it so that they can make them better. Like, you know, uh, coders who are willing to work on certain improvements that you would really like to see. It's like, you know, if the ecosystem is like, we don't actually have someone to work on faster C Python, but if you have people and you just want to do it, you might be able to go through your project and find like another five people at different companies that also want to do it. So this is, this is a great way to like help the ecosystem be involved, be a trusted member of the community that is using this code base so that you are very unsurprised when things are happening most of the time, right? Um, but also sometimes it is money. Uh, so uh, many small code bases do, uh, do lack for money. So uh, that's a great way to get involved as well. And of course, I'm happy to talk to you if you wanna give Python money. Um, so that would be, um, yeah, that would be kind of, I would, I would say, you can only give money, but I would say your best strategy is to do money and other things like showing up and listening and looking at betas and considering what is going on in your ecosystem and paying attention to the big changes that are coming. So community engagement is your best security mitigation. Um, keep those communication lines open. Um, you, if it's, you know, if you've got one person that talks to the ecosystem, try and double it up so there's a second person, so there's someone to talk to when they're out of the office, or if that person leaves, um, make sure that it's like, oh yeah, we have, we know who the Python person is at your workplace. Um, I would say the resource capacity, so um, we have, I think it is 1.1, million downloads a day on PyPI, which is huge. And we have, until recently, a, a half a person who was in charge of that workload. Um, and then because of some generous funding, we were able to hire someone who just looks at like all the user issues that are going on. Um, and there's like millions of packages on PyPI. So there's, that's a lot of users and a lot of issues. You would not believe how easy it is for people to lose a password, especially if you write at the top, like we might not be able to help you with your password reset in a timely fashion. It's almost like people immediately are like, what password? Like, um, so uh, anyway, so the, you know, being aware of like how close to overloaded a resource that you depend on is really key. And then um, we talked at the beginning about uh, including key stakeholders. If your business depends on a tech stack, like you are a key stakeholder. And so if you're not at the table, like, you know, we can't know who is downloading the code. Like with GDPR, we like really can't know even if we wanted to snoop on you and try and figure out who is downloading our code and what they're using it for. Like we like have the only stakeholders that we are able to take care of or take into account are the ones that we know about. And the only ones that we know about are the ones who tell us. So I recently um, uh, was looking at some legislation, proposed legislation in the US where they said like, so uh, software providers will proactively let all the government agencies and key infrastructure bodies that are using their code know when there's a vulnerability. And I was like, I, have, I would have to know who they are first. Because I, I mean, I know they're using Python to like go to space, but like, I don't know who I would write to, like dear NASA, like Python wanted to let you know there's been a vulnerability. So if no one tells us, then we have no way to keep you in the loop and to let you know when there are things going on. So I did want to leave time for questions and um, people to share things or if they have other thoughts, but um, that's what I have prepared. Yes. Uh, do you have any tips uh, how to allocate the time for this communication? Like in some company, there might be a pressure to uh, bill every hour or support tech lead or developer or, or story points or whatever. So how to allocate the time? 
Yeah, so um, I, that's a great question about how to allocate the time. I would say that um, in companies that have an OSPO, like you kind of designate it as like OSPO support time, might be a way to get about uh, get to that. But um, we know, and we can take this lesson from diversity, if you just like, hey, everyone should kind of be doing it, but we didn't give you any hours in the day or time uh, to do it in your regular work day, then it doesn't happen. So if you as a company want this to happen, then you have to you know, make maybe a budget item or line item and say, this is the number of hours that we expect people to be spending on this. Yeah. Yeah, and it is very similar to that. Uh, I was talking with someone yesterday about like, how do you like, like doing dry runs of disasters and figuring out like, oh, who would we talk to? And then who would we talk to next? And then like, who gets read in at what time and all those different things. It's better if you have like sort of a framework on it in advance. And um, yeah, and knowing like, like fill in the blank, like call Python, like it's, there should be something like a name there. <laughs> so, because uh, otherwise, well, you can't call us because we don't have an office. Um, so, good luck. <laughs> yes. Yeah, uh, so I was wondering how, how do you decide which of your dependencies you should be doing this for? I, I suspect a lot of orgs have too many dependencies to mm. for all of them, but perhaps I'm. Yeah, that's also a really great question because. Um, I think it depends on how integral it is to your work. So like kind of looking at like, you know, um, like looking at your workflow and kind of thinking about like, how does that go? Um, and which, which would be like, just imagine like taking it away. And then like, if it's like, oh, whew, that would be terrible. That would be like many extra hours, like people coming in overnight and like, then like you should be talking to that one. It's like, oh, I guess we'd find another calendar app. Like, okay, maybe you don't have to get so involved. I don't mean to slag on calendar apps. Like, I definitely live and die by my own calendar. But, um, yeah. And I, I think also, too, like, it, it does... Um, I think it is really nice to kind of buffet and, you know, spin up your own solution mixed of a lot of different things. But if you, uh, if you consolidate a little bit, then you might, instead of talking to like eight entities for workflow, you might get, be able to get it down to two if you're using like a related set of tools instead of picking and choosing individually for each one with no regard to how they're connected, which, you know, has some other follow-on benefits. Oh, that's a great addition. Thank you. Um, yes. How do you think about the criteria for a project to divide its like risk inherent in it? So, like active use of risk assigned to a project and making it available to a consumer to know how risky it could be. Hmm. I mean, so we're we're providing the code, so I haven't done much research on how you provide code to consumers, although um, I think like we're going to all start talking about that a little bit more with legislation like the Cyber Resilience Act where like everyone is kind of more accountable to consumers. Um, some of the things that we've been doing at Python is so like now C Python has a software bill of materials. Um, we've been looking at uh, doing SIG store for a lot of the key packages, like the ones we know that get downloaded the most and have the highest usage, um, so that that has some, you know, attestation about where it came from, the provenance. Um, a lot of Python is also now reproducible, so like even if you got it from, you like mirrored it from somewhere else, you can still check the hash and make sure that you got what you thought you got. Um, yeah, I guess for us, we really look at the usage. So if it's like, uh, if two people are downloading something a year, like we'll get to it when we get to it. If uh, 2,000 people are downloading it every single day, then that raises it up for us. So for us, that's how we think about it. Um, I guess there's like a whole constellation of other considerations you might make depending on what your business model is. So like 
if you were providing a web interface for healthcare um, for consumers to access, um, you might care a lot more about that than you do about like the little dancing thermometer widget on the front page, uh, making sure that your security, like it could be ugly, but it should be secure, right? And compliant with HIPAA, which is the legislation in the US that says you can't just leak medical data all over the place. So I guess thinking about like, what are people using and um, how much would it suck if it got screwed up? So I hope that's helpful. Any other questions? Okay. All right. Thank you so much. Um, I'm here. If you want to talk to me uh, about Python in particular more, uh, you can email me at deb at Python. And otherwise, I guess we get a couple minutes early for lunch. Thank you. <laughs>